So one world uh, state from um, oh, I've read the Australian it's Australian National University yeah, exactly. at uh, the Australian Data Archive. Um, Steve runs uh, a multi-university and funded by yeah. various government sources. Yep. Um, which uh, a lot of data is held. Um, so those of you that have used the LSA data, you would have used the Australian Data Archive. Um, Steve's background is in industrial kind of relations yep. type stuff. Yep. Um, and has since been doing a lot of research in survey kind of areas and um, hopefully, fingers crossed, next year we'll be on an ARC grant um, with some of the people here. So um, I'd like to welcome Steve and, and hand it over to you. Thank you. I have a tendency to wander, so I say I, I apologise for those on camera in, in advance. Um, sometimes it's better for me to sit down and say out of the way. Uh, so what I'm here to do today is sort of give you an overview of what we do at the Data Archive and what's available to you as, as researchers. Um, so I want to, it's a fairly informal presentation, uh, more than happy to take questions as we go through. Often you'll find that you, know, you're, you come up with a, a thought, you know, how would I do this or what, what, what about this and this. Um, so I'm more than happy to, you know, to sort of field, field questions you know, right throughout the, uh, the presentation itself. I think we've got some time at the end, um, but I say it, it often works well if we you know, sort of raise these. Uh, as I say, I'm really giving a, a, a broad brush of the sorts of you know, content that we have, the sorts of things, the services that we provide, and what we might be able to, be able to do for you as researchers, both in terms of getting things, data out of the archive uh, and, and in terms of putting things in. Um, so we, we provide support for um, sort of broad range of, uh, of activities. Um, the, so I'll, I'll start with a bit of a background um, to uh, the data archive is. Out of the way. My other tendency to fall over things as I do this presentation. The door a yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be easier. That means I don't run into the door. Um, so, um, so we've been around since 1981. Point of fact, so um, uh, in the Research School of Social Sciences at ANU, um, and our mission collect and preserve Australian social science data on behalf of the social science research community. So we were established really to try and originally try and get academic um, data that was coming out of the research school and other places, get it out for as, as broad a use as possible. Uh, and we have parallel um, organisations that we work with internationally. So in the US, there's the Inter University Consortium of Political and Social Research. Uh, there's the UK Data um, Service, Data Archive in, in the UK, and similar ones in most of the OECD countries in particular. Um, so we often work quite closely with them on, on, on different activities, and you'll find parallel content uh, in those locations. So we've got about 5,000 different data sets from about 1,500 different projects, and I'll give some examples of those. Um, our origins uh, were in particularly in public opinion and social attitude um, uh, survey. So uh, things like there were national election studies uh, being run out of the, the research school, they continue to this day, public opinion polls, uh, social attitude surveys, census data. Uh, we worked quite a lot with the, the ABS, anything prior to about 1996. Um, due to the ABS, we will throw you off to us. Uh, we can go back to 1966 if you're interested in um, uh, population tables, uh, or into 1838 if you're really interested in um, data. Uh, so there's some great stuff in there. Um, my favourite thing in that space is that they do teachers um, by what well, I best described intelligence level. Um, so there were about six uh, people who were classified as both teachers and idiots in the 1891. Maybe it was a, an actual <laughs> census. Uh, <yeah. laughs> so some really, really interesting stuff in there. Um, okay, so I say we've got lots of stuff from lots of the different locations. Uh, say, um, particularly from the the post-war, post World War II era, things like Morgan uh, Poll, Morgan Gallup Poll, um, through until about um, uh, 2006, 2007. We're trying to pack some of those, uh, administrative data, and other sources. And our origins are in supporting academic sources in particular, um, but increasingly, and you'll, you'll see this in sort of the flavour of you know, uh, some of the more, more recent stuff we have, uh, government um, data, we work with about 10 or 12 government departments, federal departments at the moment, um, and in the private sector uh, to some degree, uh, where, where those are available as well. So, in terms of 
what does the archive do? It, 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 uh, so people go, what's the data archive? Um, basically the idea is that, say, we're there to provide a repository for, to a, put things in and, and get things out in as, as simple a way as possible. So the closest parallel is really a library catalogue, um, but it's intended to be more than that. Um, fundamentally, so I've sort of highlighted some of the ideas here. So locate, request, retrieve and use data resources. Yeah, so you should be able to find um, data um, that's within our archive as simply as possible. Um, it should be as simple and, and easy as possible. Phil would comment otherwise, but uh, <laughs> I say we're, we're trying to improve that. Um, I say it varies in terms of you know, what you can do with that. Uh, by cost effective, uh, we're thinking here, particularly a resource, I know there are um, high degree students here. Uh, everything in our archive is now free. So you know, in terms of access, you know, thinking about cost of access, um, I did my own PhD with a study of 2,000 workplaces and 20,000 um, individuals. I couldn't have done anything like that in my, in my PhD program if I had to pay for, you know, for collecting that. Um, and it's at, at the same time protecting the privacy, confidentiality, intellectual property rights of those involved. And that exists on both sides of the research um, process. Both those who are collecting the research, understanding the IP uh, that you have as researchers and the institution has as, a, as an institution, uh, and of, the, of those who are being studied. So being able to you know, recognise what do we do about um, maintaining privacy and confidentiality of, of those who have been participated in our research. So things like that, and you'll see this in some of our processes, the sorts of things we do are sort of uh, thinking about how do we support um, what might be best to call managed or mediated access. Not much of what we have is actually what, you know, straight open, open access. You can't go and just click on a, you know, a data file and away you go. And the reason for that is most of what we've, what we've collected, uh, what, what, we, what we support has been collected from individuals and it's unit record you know, more often than not. Um, so it's you know identifying, you know, not identifying. Generally, it's been de-identified or, in the Australian term, confidentialised. Um, but it is you know there are small risks of identification. There are you know sensitive information that's in the mix there. And you'll see that in some of the, the content um, you know, that, that we that we cover here. So I mean, what we're trying to do is to say make it as simple as possible to get access to, to content at a unit record level because that's generally what. Need for um, for doing a lot of the research we're interested in, um, in an efficient, you know, uh, and an appropriate way. The way we organise things is into um, a set of sub archives. Um, so we have seven uh, at this point. Um, we have pushed to try and establish an education and employment archive. Haven't got the funding for that yet, but basically it's, it's incorporated within into our in, into our social science archive. Some of them are subject specific, some of them are method specific. So for example, we have a small qualitative collection um, uh, uh, for you know, providing support for text, or text and audio, some video uh, uh, and image data. Um, we have content that might be you know, on an indigenous theme. Um, so particularly those of you know, studies of indigenous populations, but also what we try to include in there is things like um, if you have indigenous indicators in the data set that you're, you're dealing with. So there are probably 30 or 40 studies of specifically focused on indigenous populations, but about 700 of the data sets have some sort of indigenous indicator in there. Uh, crime and justice, um, internet, and the last point I'll, I'll make there is a connection to international um, uh, archives as well. So we, that works in two ways. One is if we have data sets being collected by Australian researchers that have an international focus, we'll put them in there. What we also try and do is facilitate access to some of the international collections that exist. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Uh, so some of the uh, some of the international ones you can get through you know, the University yep. of Michigan yep. or, or whatever. Yep. Do you hold those and make them easier to access? Or? Uh, no. What, so what the, so, the, so the University of Michigan is probably the best example yeah. here. So different archives will, will deal with this in different ways. Um, Michigan is a membership-based archive, uh, and so Australia actually has a, a membership uh, through a group called the Australian Consortium of Social and Political Research, who, who we work with. Um, so actually for short, they run training programs. It's probably the, the one you might be familiar with. Uh, so we facilitate access on that behalf, but all the data is actually held in Michigan, and so um, for it, it is actually the, the case. Some of the data is 
open broadly. Some of it is is mediated, and we'll handle any inquiries on you know for those mediated access sources. Um, and then there's some that's restricted to uh, particular arrangements that can't go outside the states, for example. Um, there's some you know, really good health studies that have to be basically studied in the US. Uh, so it depends on what what conditions of access are as to what, what support we can provide. But yeah, we, we provide a sort of a coordinating point for all the Australian universities in terms of accessing mission. I, I know, for example, one of the issues that I was facing is that some of the uh, big US educational databases, uh, they have a public and a private uh, version. Yeah. And, and even though they're using my material, yep. my instruments, my yep. items, yep. Uh, they can't give me access yep. uh, to the private version yep. of that, despite the fact that you might can tell I have an American accent yep. and an American citizenship. Yep. Uh, can you, can, <laughs> are you able to broker that in any way? Possibly, I'm going there next month. So, um, <laughs> I, and I actually want to raise this as a, as a point yeah. um, for, for later on, is there are. Because that's, that's a place where, yeah. we, because we're now allowed to get access to the full thing. We don't need access to the full thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, 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 can I come back to that point? Because yeah, yeah. there are some, as I, I want to talk about the different ways we, you know, we, yeah. we provide a particular style of access, but there are different models that exist, and mm -hmm. we're increasingly working into some of those models. And this is a really good case in point. There's a, it's a really good study of it, um, teaching. They're doing video. They've done video of classroom uh, activities, and they're accessing it through a secure service. That would be a good example there. Um, so yeah, I'll come. I'll, I'm talking. I'll talk about some of the different models that exist, and, and, and come back to that. Okay. The um, most of the, uh, what I would say briefly on that though is most of the other archives now have a. A fairly open, not well, a mediated access, but a fairly straightforward access model where they can handle that. ICPSR is the biggest archive, um, is the biggest social science archive in the world, um, just because of their institutional arrangements. It is specific to you know, the, the specific arrangements they have, uh, and so you know we support it on that basis. Um, yeah, but if you have any questions about getting stuff from Michigan, please let me know. All right, what sort of coverage have we got? Well, it, it ranges. Um, I say there is uh, you know, sort of variation. I'll, I'll give some example studies that, that, that we have um, at the moment as well. Probably the strongest parts of the collection are in politics, public opinion, social attitudes, sociology, um, quite a lot of health as well. That's the other major collection that we kind of wanted to develop along with education and employment. Um, drugs, alcohol and tobacco, where you want to frame that, what discipline is that? Um, uh, and quite a lot of demography as well. I think it um, got a, a long history in demography. Um, so there's quite a lot built up there as well. Um, but as I say, you know, it, it, it depends upon where do we get data from? Well, as I say, it's, it's by offer. So a researcher, an organisation, an institution will approach us and say, I'm interested in this. I'll often go out and see if I see something um, and say, would you be interested in putting it with us? But say more often than not, it's an approach from a, a given organisation. So that's the other thing I'm here to say is look, if you're interested in you know, um, sharing your data, we can certainly talk about that as well. And I'll, I'll briefly touch on that at the end. Okay, so the sorts of things to say that um, the other way people tend to know you know these things is by the names of the, uh, the data sets that, that, uh, that exist. So um, uh, it's a survey, Australian Survey of Social Attitudes. It's a, 1,500 people every year, um, looking at, uh, contributes to the World Values Survey, contributes to the um, IWS, the Social Social Survey Program, um, so cross-national um, collaborative surveys. Um, the Australian election studies run after every um, Australian, every Australian election, a study of political attitude and social attitudes. Um, polling data from various sources. Uh, you can go back to 1947 with this. It really traces the origins of the Australian, um, uh, Australian well, survey, um, development of social surveys in Australia. Um, colonial data, census data, uh, and then often made large major year record data sets. Um, not so much from the ABS. The ABS have a fairly efficient mechanism for getting content out um, through the, uh, sorry, Confidential unit you know, record files, um, microdata.abs, I think is the um, link there, but most other departments don't. Uh, so we often get approached by 
um, let's say AIHW, Institute of Health and Welfare. Uh, we work with NCBR, PESA, um, in the sort of the, the education space, uh, Department of Employment, some Department of Education, um, and, and others, uh, other groups. So quite a lot of large government data sets. Uh, the most the best known of that is the Drug Strategy Health Policy Survey. This is monitoring drug use. It's the, the major prevalent survey of drug use in Australia. Um, workplace Relations Survey. Um, this is, uh, that's one well, of my PhD on, that's why it's, uh, it's referenced there. Um, they repeated that in uh, 2014. It's another report, it's actually, it's almost available. Ask me about that one. Uh, and a, a range of longitudinal studies as well. So, um, which will become more obvious in a moment. Um, studies in education, uh, longitudinal surveys of Australian youth, which is part of what um, Phil and I together, is uh, we're trying to extend the LSA um, collection into post 25, as it finished up at 25 at the moment, so, or 24. Um, so, it'll be a program you know, around that. We're about to start distributing all the, the DSS data sets as well. Um, we're currently working on a program for making those. So if you use LSAC, LSIC, Hilda, you won't have to do CDs anymore. The, anyway, yeah. Uh, you said that all the surveys are free. They will Does be that free. Mean that that it means it Hilda becomes free, yes. Including all of the updates as they go yep. along? Yep, yep. So they are moving. And we provide mediated access to the uh, administration data links? Uh, yeah, we're trying to figure out exactly how they want to do that. The So, for example, at LSAC, the Study of Australian Children has NAPLAN, uh, AEDC, Australian Early Development Census. They, they've got MBS PBS on there, yeah. They do, I think. So the question of, um, of how that will be available um, will probably depend upon which department the, the link data is coming from. Different departments have different approaches, uh, including the Department of Education. Um, so it will depend upon what the, what the process the department wants to use, and we're, trying to, we're just establishing those at the moment. Um, they fall into the, what they call the confidentialised data set, um, although you know, it's basically the more detailed collection. Uh, and we're still establishing the processes for that. But they, they are not that. They will be manageable. Um, we, as I say, we just want to know what the, what the department will be, the, the relevant departments who are providing the link data will be willing to do there as to how they go about that. Uh, and that's one of the things we do, you know, is, is for, you know, depending on which department you are, negotiate a, an arrangement which isn't, um, you know, is viable for a broad-based data access. So we're also talking to the study of men's health and the study of women's health. We, we provide distribution for both of those studies and for, and for LSA. Um, but increasingly, this is one of the areas that's becoming challenging, is what do you do when you start matching administrative data to survey data? Um, LSA are doing what they matched to recently. NAP plan. NAP plan, yeah. yeah. Um, the study of men's health, you know, they're connected to MBS PBS. So as you start putting those multiple sources together, figuring out what those processes are, um, depends upon not just the original, the originator of the survey data, it's those other, those other sources as well. So watch this space on those, but yet we will be, we will be figuring out process for that. It will probably be just a, a documented, you know, um, a sign the docs document. What I can tell you is um, even the, you will still have to sign and complete a, um, a, a, a PDF for, for or like as you, as you do now, and the dissemination should hopefully become easier under this model. Um, other things that are in there, um, say um, in, in a related area, I say you often see related content, we've got the graduate destination surveys back to the 70s. Um, they deposited up to 10 years ago. That This has now been replaced by quilt. Um, quality indicators of learning and teaching, this is higher education. Um, but they're re-ranking all of those up to 2014. Um, Graduate Careers Australia are working on those, so, so higher education is your thing. Um, staff in Australia schools is a study of principals and, and teachers um, within the Australian, uh, I don't know which states it's in, I don't think it's all states. Um, but it's matched, well, matched principal teacher uh, sample that, that exists there. Um, 2013 was on its way, but we, we have the data. 
Um, but I don't know if they did 2016 or that. Uh, and then lastly, the Young Minds Matter is there were um, surveys of mental health and well-being um, that are, this is uh, for adolescents and, and children. Um, so this is a study that was done by University of Western Australia on behalf of the Department of Health. Um, and it's been just been repeated in 2000, and I think I've got my date on there, I think it was later than 2013. Um, that's available, um, so you've got prevalence, you know, estimates for mental health in child and adolescent populations uh, that, that are there as well. The, there's another example of an interesting sort of approach. Well, their approach is you can get the access, you know, without any access to the restrictions, but you actually have to complete an ethics proposal and have your ethics approval provided as part of your application. Um, so they put on the institution, you know, what requirements institutions have for accessing the data. Tell us a little bit more about that one. Uh, okay, so that is, you know, so this is, it was, there is a national mental health and wellbeing that's run by the ABS, uh, and then they did a, a, a parallel study of um, child and adolescents. Um, it was done out of the Telcon Institute, it was the uh, UWA Telcon Institute, sort of a, um, luring of the lines there. Um, they were doing, I'm trying to think of what size the sample is, it's several thousand. Um, so it's, you know, the idea is to get pre prevalence estimates of the you know, depre depression, um, the, the, the various um, conditions it's got in there, uh, a number of instruments. Um, yeah, the, once they come to mind immediately is, is Kessler, but uh, you know, there's, there's several you know, structured instruments in there. It's got um, family functioning, uh, there's a whole range of stuff, depending on you know, what your interests are, on both you know, um, well-being, you know, mental health conditions and the like. Is it the part of the standard data that's collected in the hospital system? No, this is, so this isn't a hospital's, um, this is a, um, a, a, set, a, a random selection from the population. So this is, I'm trying to think of what the contact approach was there. It was probably, they'll, they'll have had a sampling scheme probably on, um, on geography, um, but it, you know, so you see actually relatively low incidence of those, you know, because it's trying to estimate prevalence of conditions, not um, the, the, the structure of those who you know, indicate. You know, so have. is this a self-report survey that's supplemented by uh, administrative data? No, no. Um, it, so it, it is sorry. It is self-report. It's not supplemented by administrative data yet. And they're about to do um, by the end of this year. They're hoping to release MBS and PBS with it. Um, and what else is in the mix there? There's nothing where these administrators also go. I think it's NAPLAN and, and the income support system is the other one. Mm -hmm. So from DSS. Um, yes brought up Kessler and that made me think that uh, there's a whole bunch of databases in here that use that scale. Yeah. Is there any way that um, through ADA that we could search by scale and you know no. link across data? <laughs> the short answer is I'd love to, okay. but, but no, no you can't. Uh, what I would say to that is it, it's not specifically we've gone through and said this is, you know, this is the Kessler scale. If um, we do make searchable the text where we've, where we've had it, um, if, um, so what the, the, the process of capturing the data, the importing the data is for us and making it searchable is we basically grab the content from the data files and where it's possible and where the, you know, you have to think about workload here, um, is the text of the questions from the questionnaires, from the instruments. Um, so if it exists and it, it's hard, much harder for longitudinal studies, the longitudinal instruments, there are about, I'm just trying to think of, was it 70 for one wave of Hilda or 70 across all the Hilda waves? Um, it, it just, it would take us forever to release the data if that, would, if that were the case. But certainly what we've done is grab all the content from the, the labels themselves. Um, and you can, you know, so if you're looking for common terms, if you, if you, you could search across those common terms. Yeah, that'd be one way to do it. Um, yeah, it's, it would be great. Uh, and there is some interest in doing that for some of the major longitudinal studies. Um, they've just released something in the UK um, called Closer. Uh, so it's, I forget what it's short for, but it's it's the equivalence of the LSAC. So there's a learning cohort study, um, the British cohort studies going back to about the 1940s. There is the equivalent of Hilda, the um, Understanding Society and those sorts of things, and they're trying to do exactly that. But it's a, it's a fairly intensive process 
um, because people don't deliver that. Yes, of course, they use instruments, but they don't always deliver that information into what we receive. So, okay. Um, so these are the sorts of things that say we have in the mix there. Um, I want to touch upon sort of the, the, the future interests. Um, uh, there we've, we're trying to make approaches, and this is to say if there are others that people are interested in, I'd, I'd love to know more. Um, the ADC uh, certainly was one that um, we're interested in trying to see what we can do to support you know, better access to that. Um, so that's, there's a proposal in the Department of Education at the moment to see what we might be able to achieve there. Uh, the Graduate Destination Surveys and then the, the current the quilt, um, equivalent. Uh, as I say we are getting updates and you know, um, graduate careers for Australia tells they're going to be integrated file for 40 years. So you'll be able to do you know, 40 years of um, comparative um, data there. Um, the LSA, there is a, for those who are interested in the LSA um, studies, there's a 2015 cohort, which I don't know when the data will be available yet. Usually what happens is it takes, they release the first three waves together. So first wave is PISA, um, second wave is their first internal collection. Uh, so 2017 would be the probably the point at which they'll release the, um, uh, they'll do the third wave of collection and then mid next year is probably when you'll start seeing the 2015 cohort, I would guess, um, based upon past experience. Um, and I don't know if there's going to be a 2018 cohort uh, yet. They were doing some reviews of the studies. And are you limiting yourself to the funny piece of sampling? Uh, it, it's literally the, it's the piece of sample. Okay. Um, so you're so, using the age uh, sample rather than the year in school or whatever? Um, I'm just thinking of how I do it. I know how pieces of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it, so, so what they do with LSA is they literally, they follow up the, 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 a, as much as they can of a piece of sample the year after. Um, so they say whatever, however PISA is recruited, that's what they're stuck with. Um, there has been some discussion and we, we talked in the project about this, about um, whether it's, you know, they're interested in thinking about different ways of sampling for LSA in the future, but right now it's, it is, it is. No, no, no. I, yeah. It's great to be able to follow up on the uh, yeah. piece of that's a, that's a remarkable uh, yeah. uh, contribution. Yeah, and the, the one challenge they have is they aren't able to put enough information in with the piece of folks to be able to get it. So the response rates the year after PISA is, is fielded is a bit longer than they would like because they, they don't have the connection at that point in time to basically recruit off the back of it. Yeah, they do follow them up. Yeah, but it's it's very limited information that they actually provide about LSA when they're recruiting for PISA. It'd be great if you have a little bit more overlap in the content. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah it, I mean, it's right now there's so little overlap in the content of the two. Yeah, yeah it, it's as I say, it'd be nice to do more in that space, and I and as I, say, I think that yeah, well uh, they will be working on 2018 at the moment, but. Uh, it would be nice to sort of see some of those. That would definitely do a, um, a request for information. I would guess it would be coming pretty soon, actually. It'd be some late this year, early next year. The 2015 should be a little better because they've put a lot more focus on like, social variables. And this. Yeah, there was quite a lot of work, let's say, after. So there was no 2012 cohort with PISA. Um, there was 2015. They spent a lot of time going, well, what do we, what do we need to improve? Um, so that might make, though, the comparability of the LSA cohorts a bit more challenging. Um, and then lastly, as I say, we are we starting, to, starting to see things like um, uh, increasingly attaching you know, um, Australian administrative data to some of the samples. So that point about, is there administrative data with this? Um, we've just, as I say, we've just received you know, um, an initial you know, query from, uh, from UWA that they're matching these things in. Uh, and so there will be uh, certainly, you know, medical data, um, and I say I think I've forgotten the. I, I wasn't sure on the status of the income support data um, for the going up months data as well. Have you thought of uh, integrating some of the my school uh, website data? Uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see. It's because um, we it's in the public domain, sort of. Yeah. Um, well, this this is another one that that um, I say. 
actually folks are interested to say, I, I'm happy to go out and find out more things like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so there is, you know, that question of how do you match um, uh, match the, the, the content um, while maintaining the privacy. I mean, in in the end, what we tend to get is the things that have already been matched, um, and this is something we're exploring. Is 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 it worthwhile looking at actually there's a set of common content that you often want to match across multiple sources that um, you know, on the administrative side, when we start talking to the departments about thinking in that way, um, that hasn't progressed very far yet. It's, it, you know, it's, you know, usually things that come up, it's like that, like my school, you know, MBS, PBS on medical, you have, um, you yeah, know, income support, uh, you know, there are some obvious candidates and there's actually about half a dozen of them that are regularly being matched. Could be for more to actually support, facilitate matching many things into those data sets. Um, so that that's of interest, but we, we we need to look at how that might be supported, funded. You know, you know, um, part of it depends on what you get in the data in the first place. Could you, can you even do the matching in the first place? So, um, but yeah, as I say, if people if people have interest, so I'd certainly you know, be interested in hearing you know, hearing about them. Um, Okay, so I, I, I have some, some brief websites. I, I'm not going to say too much about the website itself, and the reason is is that we're we're moving over to um, uh, a new system over the next you know, the next several months, um, and I'll, I'll quickly flash that up then. But the, the idea here is to say, I mean, what what coming back to what we were trying to do as an archive is to make access as finding things and accessing things as simple as possible within the constraints of the you know. The, the, the maintaining the privacy and confidentiality. So as I said, um, trying to make search and finding things, and then there's often an administrative procedure that comes along with it. Um, in terms of the website itself, um, I say it doesn't really matter what's in the text here, um, but there's a simple search box uh, that exists there. There's links to those you know, collections that I have here. There's a whole bunch across the top of the, the, the archive um, of information on how to use the archive, you know, access models, request forms, and so forth. There's some basic things down the right hand side as well. Um, the other, what you find when you, you know, when you go into searching, we produce results a bit like a library catalogue. Um, uh, and then we have basically a catalogue record for every data set. Um, well, actually for every collection. So those 1500 collections, there might be several data sets within those collections. Uh, the things we include in that, uh, this ties into Phil's question about um, searching for Kessler, for example. So we describe the study which is the project. Um, so what was the methodology that was used? Who were the PIs? Um, what's the access model? Um, you know, what years does it cover? You know, broadly, you know, what do you need to know in order to understand the basics of the methodology? We have a lot of other information, which I'll, I'll touch on in a moment, um, in, the, in, the, in the three tabs. But So there's some basic cataloging information, which help, should help you to start with. There is every variable. In the, in the data set is documented um, at least what let's say at a minimum what was the the information that was in the SPSS file or stata file whatever it might be we've extracted that out and so that that is searchable the text you know that exists there um, and we've pulled out you know what sort of variable is is, is it a categorical is it a, you know uh, is it a scale etc etc uh, all the value labels are in there as well um, and then thirdly we have a related materials now that related materials section basically includes whatever documentation we've got. So instruments are there. So all the questionnaires are there. They're not always, they're, they're in PDF. They're not always searchable. Um, but the documents there, any technical reports we've got, um, so that those, those related materials in and of themselves are actually a treasure trove for future use if you're looking to develop your own instruments. I use that, I teach um, uh, survey you know, design. Uh, I often point people to those just as a resource for coming out. You know, don't bring your own questions. You know, learn, you know, what do we know about how do you develop instruments? The instruments are already there. So there's all that, you know, all the instruments are certainly there, but all the, the technical documentation, whatever it exists, we ask people to provide, you know, whatever you have available, generally the more the better is the model. Uh, and then we have a link off to actually, if you want to access the data, there's a link to our online registration system so that you can um, basically click here and go, all right, you know, make, and, you know, make a request for the data itself. And that happens you know, um, from that catalog page. So as I 
the, the idea of the catalogue record is it tells you what's there, but it also gives you a portal into accessing the data. There are, so who uses it? So say we, um, well we have two different types of use. A lot of, you know, a lot of researchers want to pick up the data and take it, you know, take it open, and that's our primary model. Um, but that's actually only about, um, for every data file that gets downloaded, um, we have about 10, 10 to 12,000 in any given year people doing just simple cross tabulation. So there is a tabulation engine. You can go on and look at all the frequencies. You can do some basic cross tabs. That might be enough. You know, there are people who will just go and look up what was the you know, support for um, abortion or support for same sex marriage. And that's, they just want to figure for their, you know, their paper. Um, so it's, it's about a 10 to 1 ratio. Uh, it's also useful for going, is this got the basics of what I need? In this data set to do the sorts of analysis I want, so it's a useful, you know, preliminary um, investigation tool, uh, and both of those are linked off from that access um, page. What we find about um, though, so the analyses, the tabulation system, about half of those are undergraduates; they only download about five percent of the data files. Um, postgraduates, um, uh, it's uh, about half the you know, the data downloads, and the researchers, and then other other areas as well. The media. Non-government organisations, government departments use these as well. Um, I'll skip over this for the, in the interest of time. Um, I was going to say, I mean, there is a, increasingly an emphasis on sharing data. So this sort of thing was the aim of this particular section of the discussion. Um, you'll do, see. Do you access the website through the ACU page, or is there a direct? I just yeah, it's, it's there's a link at the end. It's ada.edu.au. Um, yeah. So, yeah, as I say, it's not, um, we don't require like the ACU login or you know, university login. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's held, held separately. Um, that's been one of our challenges as well. But yeah, it's, um, you can directly access it from, um, from ADA. I'm just going to click forward on this, I think. Um, so, this comes back to the question you were raising before about you know what are the models that exist for sharing data, um, and the reason I raise this is that you, there are different ways of getting stuff out as well as, as as putting stuff in. Sorry, putting stuff in. People wonder wonder about you know, how do I share sensitive data? How do I share video data? Um, now our primary model is actually you know tabulate things online, which, which fits with a quantitative you know um, a model, and through download of the data. So you request the access and you get a data file. Um, but there are other mechanisms for doing so, and, and um, some of you may have used some of these models. This was a, a profile that was done by, um, this is the Office of National Statistics in the UK. Um, there are quite different sorts of models. The, the click and get a CSV or you know, an SPSS file is one of the options. Um, increasingly, we, we are seeing um, secure access models being, uh, being available. Um, the best known of those here in Australia is what's called SHORE, the Secure Unified Research Environment, run by the Sachs Institute in conjunction with what's called the Population Health Research Network. And you can access some of the, the versions of the files uh, through that system. Um, there is another, the ABS have recently developed for their um, uh, year record files that have more detailed information, an equivalent system. Has anyone used the, in the past, um, what am I, what's the thing I'm thinking of? The remote access rattle system. If you have, you know you don't want to use it again. This is basically a, it, it's what, it's so the, the model they're moving towards now though is basically a virtual desktop. So you, you basically dial in, you have a secure port like you have a virtual private network and you access the data on their servers. So coming back to that point about the University of Michigan, they have such a model um, for some of the access to, to their data. That might be an option for you for accessing some of the some of the things. Is that the, generally the problem is where is the data once it leaves our system? You know, is under a data download system. I don't know where you know these data files are. You know, they're probably on Dropbox somewhere, uh, and you know, um, so the, the concern, that's what the concern becomes. If you can maintain access to the system, and that's the, so that's they developed that model. That might be a mechanism. So they are. For example, sharing data with going the other way. The, the German um, data access laws require that, um, that you can't leave Germany. 
there are people in Michigan dialing into Germany to access the, the employment registers in Germany using such a model. <laughs> They're doing it. They're saying it's increasingly the, the, the framework. If you can't get, if you can't bring the data to you, you, you find a way of getting you to the data. Um, and, and so, as I say, so the ABS have, have, have moved in this direction. If you, so, it's increasing. If you want to analyse their data, um, they have the basic files available to download. Um, well, again, on their CDs, but you know the others will be available through um, a remote model. Uh, and it's just like using your own Windows desktop. For those of you who are Mac users, and I'm one. Sorry. It is what it is, um, but it's pre it's pretty handy. And then there's the on-site thing, so you can go to these offices and do it and analyze it online. This is a nice sort of intermediate model. This is also a model, probably, for, for thinking about accessing qualitative data. If you're you know thinking about how you might provide access to video in particular, but you know, or audio transcripts, that might be an arrangement you, you can set up. There are costs involved, um, but you know th these are models that, that exist. And so the educational videos that I was talking about from Michigan, I'm pretty sure they've made them available through that the remote access model. We tend to focus on the, the say, the, the data download model, but we do facilitate access through other systems that's required. Uh, and if you're increasingly using administrative and, and um, administrative sources, that's probably one you'll be, you'll be pushed into once the data starts getting a bit sensitive. Um, there's a framework for this. Um, I've got a, I'm not going to say anything about this, but say what, what's it's generally referred to as the five safes model. Um, basically, if you're thinking about how you make data available, you can, you can you know, uh, talk about five different aspects of safety. Um, anonymizing data is one part of that. Um, actually using safe people, you know, looking at projects, looking at the systems that they use. Uh, you can put them in safe settings under a, a virtual environment. Or you can do, and, and there are some organisations, the ABS for example, who do this, you can check the outputs of what comes out the other end as well. Um, so you know, if you run your regression model or your, tab your table, uh, you get um, outputs out the other end and they have to be vetted to make sure they're not providing any disclosure. Um, I won't talk any more about that, so I can point you all to a, um, a YouTube um, that we've just done a couple of weeks ago on, on, on safe access. Um, but what I will do is say, well, basically, how do we, you know, how do we provide um, microdata? Fundamentally, we do, you know, data downloads and, 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 and online analysis through our website. Find the data file, register, request access is the is the basic model. Um, we provide storage, um, a preservation of search data um, that's intended for reuse. So we don't we don't archive things that people don't want to share. That's not that's not our purpose. Your institution can do that, but if you're particularly interested in sharing data for other, for others to use, um, so we, we, we enable that and we do it through a, a group called National Computational Infrastructure, which is um, based in Canberra. It's a federally funded um, collaboration between the Department of Education, no, not Department of Education, yes, Education and um, a, a number of the universities uh, and CSI program. Um, we can provide some support for projects that are in, in progress if the aim is to share the data at the end of the, um, the, 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 the process. We have different access models. Most of, the same. Most of them are oriented around you know, straight um, uh, download access or tabulation access. Um, and we have different sort of levels of you know, approval. Do you want to approve, you know, approve all the, the access yourself? Do you want it to be open? You know, so we can set up a situation where people have to um, you know, if you want to share your data, you can be the final arbiter as to whether someone gets access or not um, on the basis of a project proposal that comes through. Um, and we have different, you know, say reuse arrangements. It might be browsing the, the catalogue. Um, we have dissemination service for, um, uh, uh, for through the tabulation and download system. We do support ad hoc requests for other data as well. Um, so things like older census data, People want, want access to that. We'll, we'll organise that through a system called Cloud Store, and it's a, uh, an online Dropbox type um, system run by Arnit, which runs the Australian University. We, as I say, I've, I've kind of covered the different types of approaches, so I might just just quickly give you a look at um, um, some of the interfaces. So, as I say, this is you know, a basic um, catalogue system. Uh, we have 
an online analysis system which includes all the frequencies. Like, the, the words don't matter here, that's why I'm flipping through. It's, but the point is you can see all the frequencies on the, the system itself, so it's a database which includes all the, the questions, um, all the, the categories and all the distributions. Um, you can have weighted distributions there as well. Do you need um, to request access to those? Or you can it, de it, it depends on the, the, okay. the, the access model. So we have about 90% of our stuff is, no, you need to be registered yeah. to use the system, but you don't actually have to request access. Sure. So, so we can distinguish between the analysis here, where you don't get access to the unit the down the line data, but you can run the numbers and download the data and take it away. Um, so, so all of our take away data, you know, the, the download data is by request, but the, the tabulation system, this is where a lot of our undergraduate use comes from, is they want to run the numbers and don't really need the data itself. Um, that's okay. So there's frequencies, you can run cross tabulations, you can do weighting, there is even a very simple linear regression model in there. I wouldn't, wouldn't use it, but um, <laughs> it's very simple. Uh, <laughs> but you can use it. Um, and then, as I say, our, our download system is a, a, a basic and online request form. Sometimes we'll ask you to provide more information, sometimes we'll ask you to sign a, an additional form, um, depending upon what the data set is, it depends upon what the, the restrictions are. Uh, and then, you know, from the, from the website, so it's a simple, you know, simple form here, comes through to the, the data archive. This will be changing slightly, but uh, as we move to our new system, but the, the basic model is the same. The idea is that you, know, you find the data and you can request it as, as easily as possible. Um, I'll finish up with this last line on depositing data. So the, the, the accessing data, let's say there's lots of ways to, you know, it's simple search engine, simple as possible to, to request the data, but we actually make it quite hard to, to go and get it. And the, that, I say it is for those confidentiality and, and access reasons. That's, that's the, the point is we're a trusted environment on both sides of the equation. People know where to find this stuff. But, you know, it's not, there are obligations that come with it. That's, that's the, the trade-off. So that has parallels in the deposit side as well. So, as I say, any of these, obviously these are being provided by researchers, by organisations. I want to say briefly about depositing that. If you're interested, you can see some of the things we can do and, and therefore you know, how we might be able to support you as well. Um, so we can provide advice on, you know, what's the, what's the purpose of sharing, what benefits are there um, that exist, how to deposit your data, what sort of formats, um, how, to, how to store your data, conditions of access, you can see we've got lots of different possible models that exist there. Um, we have a, a deposit form, um, and so basically it tells us how we can build up that catalogue record, but also you have to provide us with a licence. We don't own any of the data. You know, all, all the ownership goes with the people who own it, whether that's your institution or you as individuals. So what we take is, you know, the intellectual property remains with the researcher and with the institution. Um, the, we have a license to distribute it on your behalf. Um, so we do need authorization to do that. Um, we can also talk about you know, specific types of data um, and, you know, we often get queries about all, all sorts of different directions. But as I say, I'm happy to talk more about, you know, supporting, you know, if you want to put some stuff in, um, that's usually a, a very a specific conversation, so yeah, um, that, that question's open. Right? Um, finally, so we are moving to a, a slightly you know, slightly different model um, on our database. So, so I'll, that's the other reason I wanted to flip through some of the, the website information is it will move um, in about three months' time uh, to a model that's developed by called Dataverse. Um, this is developed by the Harvard Institute of Quantum Social Science. This, the other benefit of this is it should, this should make putting data into the archive easier. Well, this is a model for developing replication data. Um, so if you're interested in, in you know, um, open science rep replication models, this, this was one of the, the, the models that existed. Um, so they have replication data for a number of different journals. That's part of the reason we went for it. it makes depositing easier. It's a really simple you know, drag and drop, fill out the, you know, fill out the form to collect all the, the catalogue information. Uh, we'll be aiming to release that in, say, hopefully by 30 June this year. But you can see that the, the, the view, you know, again, ignore the, the words, this is the Harvard version of it. The view is basically the same. Search, make it as easy as possible, click a button, find the data itself. And this will be coming, let's say, we have our development server up, should be soon. 
Other than that, that's probably all the, all the sell I can give you. <laughs> but the, the one question that people might want to know yep. is what the benefits of depositing your, do your data are. Mm -hmm. And I suppose so the one question I have that is, um, is there a way that um, as a, you know, I can deposit my data that you would be able to give me statistics on yep. how many people looked at it, how many people did yep. cross tabulations, how many people done it? Yes, we can. So we track all of those things. Um, it's like it, it becomes even more obvious than the, the database model. I think we can go back. Uh, I haven't got a data set file there, but literally there's a count on the page, even there, so you can see sort of a popularity measure. The other thing it has, though, is a citation. Uh, and this is the other, the other part is um, you'll have seen uh, ERA and you know, exercises like that is, is non traditional outputs, the sort of the form they're putting into here. Um, data sets are increasingly becoming, you know, it's possible to do so. So we, we, um, we, we are at the moment developing some of our DIIs um, under our existing system, but we will be automatically creating DIIs. So, um, so it will be citable, it will be structured. Um, so this is a, a thing that, that can be followed and tracked in the same way anything else can. Uh, and yeah, and once it's stored in that way, um, yeah, it's fairly easy to collect all the, the background information. So we know how many people have downloaded, how many people have tabulated every data set that we have. Um, back to about 2005, when this thing came online. Um, yeah, so it's, it's certainly possible to do that. But yeah, that, that point about, you know, what, where's the credit is, is really the selling point there. Is, you know, what, what benefit is there to doing this? Well, there is, you know, I would say two arguments. One is, there is now citation that's possible. Depends a bit on your journals and you know, the pub publishing practices being your discipline. But secondly, there is a um, you know that section in the, the ARC grants which says data management. Okay, if you've done those, that's what this is really about. Well, they don't really care how you manage your data. Like, you know, um, in the project itself, what they want to know is what additional investment they're getting after the fact. So they want to know how you're distributing and sharing to get maximum use of the public funds that, uh, um, that have been you know, provided. That's really what that data management section is. Because <coughs> um, the other part is just ethics. You know, it's, we know, we, 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 we know people fall under you know, human research ethics committees, you know, so they're expected to do that. <coughs> they're really interested in what's going to happen next for them. So, brownie points, I guess. Are there any standards I would have to fulfill to upload the data? Are there variable naming conventions? Uh, we don't. We what? The model we do is we take what we get and we provide we'll provide suggestions back. You know. Um, so no, there aren't. Um, we can provide advice on that though, as to what's you know ways to go about that. And uh, I mean, to be honest, it depends upon the project as to what's the the right model. You know, people go, well, why put V1, V2, V3? Um, you, know, as, you know, it seems like a really silly you know, way to name your variables. Now, I can say when you're doing international projects, that's just the quickest way to actually get integration across 30 countries. It's not a bad idea. So, it, it, yeah, it's, we can provide advice on different ways you might go about that. And we, when we, certainly when we do our archiving and, and curation, we sort of look through and go, okay, this probably is not as informative as it could be. We might provide additional suggestions. So do um, you also do that if I wanted to use a data set you have and I don't understand it? Is there a manual for every data set? Yes, yes. So that, so, so that point about those related materials. So as I say, what, what, the information that was generating all those frequencies also gets produced into a cup, what, a cope is the, the term we would use there. And it gets produced automatically. So you can just click on there, it will give you everything that's in the, um, a PDF of everything that's in the catalog record uh, and every, every variable and every every group of variables. So, and a lot of that's a mix of people. I've got a, t a team of staff doing the catalog information, but a lot of that depends upon what comes in on the data files. We harvest that automatically, so that's why we sort of provide some suggestions back. You know, people have used the same name for five variables. We go, well, maybe you might want to differentiate those a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard enough getting people to deposit in the first place, so we don't sort of, you know, go, no, we won't accept that unless it has, unless literally we can't understand it. Okay. Yeah. How do you deal with um, updates to the data? So if I'm downloading data, do you let me know if you... Uh, we don't, 
you can subscribe to a changes in the data yeah, in the study. Um, it's not even really easy. Um, I have to say, so most data sets don't get updated, yeah. would, be, would be the, the case there. Those that do are longitudinal studies, which often have a, a user community around them and a, a communication mechanism for doing so. We work, we work with those communities to do that. Um, or other major studies. And what we might do is actually report, you know, if there's a new release, we'll, we'll write to those who have downloaded the data in the past and you know, let them know that something has come up. It's, um, I'm just trying to think of what's the, there is a subscription model where you can say, yes, I'm interested in this data and you know, I can maintain an update. It's you know, not as strong as it could be. Um, but as I say, it's not generally an issue for 99% of the data sets. But the ones that are, are the ones that actually have you know, the most value. So there is generally a, a mechanism outside of the outline for facilitating that anyway. Yeah, thanks, Sue. It sounds like you guys are doing some really interesting, valuable work. Do you have any examples of like, creative uses of the Australian data that you can speak to where people have like, taken things off and found something new inside? Sort of? uh, I, I usually have a slide. No, I don't think I have it in here. Um, it's a great project that was done by... Uh, what was his name? Eric or Rick Uslander at... Um, uh, Maryland University. He was interested in social trust and segregation in modern societies. So he took data from the social cohesion surveys that were run by Andrew Marcus at, at Monash University. He was using a bit of the Australian social surveys, survey social attitudes as well. Put that in census data. Um, so looking at Jimmy, you know, distributions of populations by postcode area. Um, took the postcode information that was available to match the, the social trust measures within those um, those data sets. And there was a third part I've forgotten, but it was bringing multiple data sets together to be able to do something like that. The other example I've, I can give you is the front page of our annual report this year is going to have um, people doing, uh, we had from our design school in um, the, uh, at, at ANU doing data, you know, literally sort of visual displays, not of the the information content of the, the data itself, but you know, literally saying, okay, what patterns do you see when you just start looking at the relationships between the numbers? Um, so trying to do some sort of visual, you know, visual dynamics of, of the data itself. So it, um, people looking at you know, the historical development of Japan, the relationship between Australia and Japan, going back to the old Morgan polls. Um, I reckon there's some really cool stuff to be done on, I reason I mentioned that thing about idiots, you know, idiot teachers, is there's progressions of language so we have markup of the language that was in censuses. There's things you could do. The, the, the progression of the, the collection of the data over time is it, that really starts getting quite interesting, particularly when you get up questions over time. We have a couple of projects we're working on following public opinion in Australia over 50 years will be the end of that. One last question. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> With the people who deposit data, you know, the academic community is a pretty mobile one. Yep. So, um, I mean, the one that comes to mind, I think it's the 10 year longitudinal study I applied for once, but the person that was supposed to say yes or no yep. had left and nobody could find it. Yep. And so that data set is sitting on your database, but nobody can access it. What, yeah. What's the plans of. Uh, so, we, where we can find, well, two things. One is where we can find an institutional contact, we, we go back and you know, uh, it tends to be on the basis of when the request comes up. So we don't get notifications always. The other thing is trying increasingly to actually focus on it not being a person, but being a function or a role within the institution. So this is mostly a problem for, for government mm -hmm. content, but yes, um, we have data from people who are dead. Um, the, there is a, an, a third element there, which is which is our backup plan, which is if we don't hear from the depositor in 30 days, then by, and this is under the licensing, um, then the archive director falls to me can make a decision on the basis of the information that's provided. Um, now that's not in, you know, that's like the, I mean, every license because some some department in particular say, no, we want to retain final, final say. But if we, you know, if we have a situation, particularly with academic researchers, is we have a default, you know, 
If we don't hear, we can make, we can make the decision on the basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming away. No worries. Uh, <laughs> Thanks again. Um, so I, I will quickly get at the end there. <coughs> so I've got a website at the end. But, um, it's just ada.edu.au. And if you need to contact us, ada at anu.edu.au. And I think all of this is going on there. YouTube and, uh, and I'm happy to make the slides available anyone from as well. So let me know. Thank you.